FIFA's decision to grant the 2022 World Cup to Qatar will focus unprecedented international attention on the tiny Gulf nation. Sitting on 5% of the world's natural gas reserves, Qatar is one of the richest places on the planet. The capital Doha is filled with lavish new developments, like this luxury shopping mall with its Venice-inspired canals, or the world-class sports facilities of Sports City. But there is a darker side to this Middle East boomtown. In a vast industrial sprawl well away from Doha's palm-lined waterfront, hundreds of thousands of poor migrant workers subsist in often abject conditions. Qatar and its neighbors in the Gulf region have some of the world's most restrictive rules on labor rights, preventing the development of effective trade unions and denying the right to strike or to collectively negotiate to the migrants who make the vast majority of his workforce. With a massive influx of labor expected in the run-up to 2022, the international trade union movement is insisting on improvements. The pressure is on FIFA, the Qatari authorities and international companies lining up for lucrative World Cup contracts to ensure decent working and living conditions for the migrants. The conditions for migrant workers in the Middle East are unacceptable. The World Cup is a time when the eyes of the globe will be on Qatar and the other nations in this region. We will do everything to see that FIFA lives up to its responsibilities, that multinationals providing goods for the uh, World Cup and their supply chains are actually respectful of workers' rights. Here in Doha's industrial area, workers from India, Nepal, Somalia, the Philippines and an array of other developing nations live squeezed into overcrowded company accommodation. Some firms do provide decent housing, but countless workers like these Sri Lankan welders are lodged in unhygienic fire traps. Four men share each of the airless cell-like rooms. They abandoned the filthy kitchen after several cases of food poisoning and now have to collect meals from elsewhere. A nearby block choked with dust from a neighboring cement factory is lit only by candles. The Indian and Nepalese inhabitants say they are lucky if the company turns on the electricity and water for three hours a day. Such conditions are not unique to Qatar, but are repeated along the oil-rich Gulf Coast. Dubai is a city divided. Visitors to its glamorous new landmarks, like the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building, or the seven-star Burj Al Arab Hotel, live a world apart from the army of low-income workers who built them. Migrants are forced into pockets of slum accommodation, or banished to a desolate, male-only suburb on the edge of town. In the shadow of Dubai's gleaming financial center, it's easy to find 60 men packed into a villa, abandoned by families when the Satwa neighborhood was marked for demolition. After a long day's grind on the building site, the lucky ones among this group of Bangladeshi migrants have a narrow bunk bed to rest on, little more than a shelf. Others, however, make do with a patch of floor in a room they share with over 10 workmates. More than 160,000 men live in a township of dusty roads and grim labor camps next to a mountainous waste dump. The men living there call it Sonapur, a Hindi name meaning city of gold. The inhabitants are poor manual workers, mostly from South Asia or poorer parts of the Arab world. This is a male-only city. The men live isolated from their families and have few distractions from their daily toil when they are bussed back to their cramped, prison-like housing blocks. Conditions are often squalid, but on their one day off a week, they somehow manage to emerge in immaculately clean clothes for Friday prayers, followed by a game of cricket.
These are resilient men making heroic efforts to send money back to their families. They are prepared to put up with long hours and harsh living conditions. There is widespread distress, however, over the non-payment of wages and cheating by employers and recruitment agencies, which means salaries are often much lower than those promised before the workers leave home. This Bangladeshi construction worker's story is all too typical. Nine hours, and he's got no payment for five months. His family almost called him and asked the money because they're his family. Seven family members in his house. He also have wife in Bangladesh, but he doesn't have kids so far. Before the wages dried up, he was getting $400 a month. Like so many of the workers, he spent a big slice of his wages paying off an illegal fee of thousands of dollars demanded by the agency that recruited him back home. The Gulf nations recruit foreign workers through a system known as kafala, which effectively bonds them to the company that sponsors their passage. They cannot switch to another employer without permission, because the sponsors often hold their passports, meaning it's also difficult for them to go home before their contracts are up. Governments in Qatar and the United Arab Emirates have taken some steps to improve things. Recent laws are designed to make sure wages are paid on time, relax some of the sponsorship restrictions and crack down on unscrupulous recruitment agencies. Implementation, however, is patchy and it remains impossible to form effective trade unions. Driven to desperation by poor treatment or non-payment of wages, some workers run away from their sponsors. These South Asian men are unable to work legally in the UAE and lack the money or the travel documents to get home. So they are living rough and depend on badly paid casual jobs and handouts from a local charity. This Indian doctor is making a delivery of rice and curry to dozens of men sleeping in a park in the city of Sharjah, a half-hour drive from Dubai. The masses of men in blue overalls slaving away on the pharaonic construction sites of Dubai, Abu Dhabi and Doha are not the only low-income workers in Qatar and the UAE. Hidden away from view, there are also tens of thousands of women migrants. Most of them work in domestic service, where they are denied even the basic protection provided by local labor laws. They run the risk of verbal, physical and sexual abuse. Many are kept as virtual prisoners in their employers' homes. Soraya, a young mother from the Philippines, says she was forced to work up to 20 hours a day under the constant threat of violence from her boss. I am so really, I'm not really uh, used to work like that like a, a machine because uh, she's doing like this, do this one, do this and make it fast, make it fast I'm not a machine, right? and then um, sometimes uh, she will hit me she don't want uh, she, she likes really really much clean with the house that she has and then that's it and then uh, Sometimes if I, if I have a mistake, she will hit me. Soraya says she ran away after her boss beat her with a stiletto-heeled shoe. Now in a safe house run by the Filipino embassy in Doha, she awaits deportation from Qatar. She was earning $220 a month, but has little hope of recouping the eight months of unpaid wages owed her. 2022 may seem like a long way away. But the race to complete a massive World Cup infrastructure program that includes 12 stadiums, 70,000 new hotel rooms and a network of road and rail links has already begun. Qatar has an opportunity to become an example for the region and show the world that it can be a worthy host for the biggest show in sport. That won't happen if the World Cup is tainted by workers' suffering.
Together with FIFA, the Qatari authorities must guarantee a fair deal for the foreign migrants who will be so crucial to the tournament's success.